Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1159 of This Week in Amateur Radio. First-time exam applicants must obtain an FCC registration number, that's an FRN, before taking any amateur radio exams. The April 2021 Volunteer Monitor Program Report has been released. We will have all the details. Amateur operators in India assist with transporting supplies to COVID patients, as the virus is rampant in that country. The ARRL is proposing a special workshop for attorneys at the upcoming 2022 National Convention in Orlando. Amateurs in New Zealand once again have access to the 60-meter band. They are planning to launch a new amateur radio satellite made of plywood. <laughs> We're not making this up. We will have the story. The Intrepid DX Group, the expedition team to Beauvais Island, adds its second physician to the team. eBay hands Spectrum regulators control over non-certified equipment sellers. And... An upcoming history seminar will highlight one of America's most notable amateurs. We will tell you who it is and how you can participate in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit, including the one made of plywood. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us about Microsoft's postponement of the Windows 10X update. He will also introduce us to the new Apple AirTags. He will talk about microphone and audio manufacturer Sennheiser being sold, and will tell us about the puzzle-solving computer that finally won at Crossword Puzzles. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us how to get started with Whisper utilizing a Pluto SDR. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to look at the lives of amateurs back in the year 1958, when the key word was satellites. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about methods of replacing that old rotor that lives on top of your tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful, sunny spring is finally here, Albany, New York. I am George W2XBS. And reporting this week from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our Catskill Mountain radio station, high atop Sand Hill in the western Catskills of New York, where the garden peas are up about six inches already, and we're very hopeful for more to come, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where there's finally some sunshine, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where things may be getting rather soggy in the weather department this week, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off our news this week, beginning on May 20th, 2021, all amateur examination applicants will be required to provide an FCC registration number to the volunteer examiners before taking an amateur exam. With more on this new regulation, we go to League Headquarters in Newington, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. This is necessary due to changes the FCC has made to its licensing system. Amateur candidates who already have an FCC license, whether for amateur radio or another service, and already have an FRN, may use the same number. All prospective new FCC licensees, however, will be required to obtain an FRN before the examination and provide that number to the volunteer examiners on the Form 605 license application. 
An FCC instructional video provides step-by-step instructions on how to obtain an FRM through the FCC's Commission Registration System, or CORS. That video is at www.fcc.gov forward slash R-O-F-R-N. The FRN is used afterward by the applicant to download the license document from the FCC's Universal Licensing System, to upgrade a license, apply for a vanity call sign, and to submit administrative updates such as an address or email change and renewal applications. After June 29th, all applications will be required to contain an email address for FCC correspondence, but as we've just learned, the FCC will shield email addresses from public view in the ULS. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Applicants will receive an email directly from the FCC with a link to the official electronic copy of their license whenever a license is issued or changed. ARRL VEC suggests that those without access to email should use the email address of a family member or friend. Licensees will be able to log into the ULS using their FRN and password to download the latest version of their license at any time. The FCC no longer provides paper license documents. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. Here is the April 2021 Volunteer Monitor Program report. A general class renewal applicant withdrew his application after FCC noticed that the renewal application would be held up pending review of Volunteer Monitor complaints. As a consequence, the Quakertown, Pennsylvania applicant has no operating privileges. 21 operators in 14 states received advisories because of their operation in the March CQ Worldwide DX contest. While making contacts with VC3T and VC2W, their LSB signals extended below 7.125 MHz, which is the lower limit of the 40-meter amateur phone band. Volunteer monitors participated in a nationwide training program on April 7th that was conducted by ARRL and the FCC. Volunteer monitors had two meetings in April with FCC Enforcement Bureau personnel. The totals for volunteer monitor monitoring in March were 1,394 hours on HF frequencies and 2,515 hours on VHF and above frequencies. Our thanks go out to Volunteer Monitor Coordinator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this article. As COVID-19 continues to devastate India, amateur radio operators in West Bengal are helping healthcare workers and patients by providing a network of support. Club Secretary Ambarish Nag Bijwaj, VU2JFA, said that the West Bengal Radio Club and the students of the Indian Academy of Communications and Disaster Management are providing access to food as well as to life-saving medicines, plasma and oxygen, and assisting the neediest with admission into healthcare facilities. The Academy is an amateur radio training institute headed by Rinku Nagbizwaz, DU2JFB. He said other hams in these two groups are also arranging for mental health support to be provided online for those who need it. Meanwhile, club members Arnab Roy Chowdhury, VU3JWN, Arum Bhattacharya, VU3ZIB, Debbuta Mutherjee, VU3JXA, and Jayanta Vaidya, VU3YJB, have all been working around the clock, even as two other members of the club become stricken with COVID and are now receiving treatment. Ambarish Nag Bijwa said, We're happy to help people in this crisis period. We believe that HAM stands for Help Always Mankind. The BBC reports that the online sales platform eBay is handing regulators such as Ofcom the power to remove listings directly. Officials will be able to remove items where they have evidence of a risk to consumer safety, eBay said. Online marketplaces such as eBay are engaged in a constant battle to ferret out unsafe items sold by their users, and this is partly because nearly anyone can create a listing on online auction sites.
eBay said that the move was designed to speed up the removal of illegal or unsafe items without waiting for approval from the company. Only selected, trusted authorities will have access to the new control tools. Those that do will have the ability to take down any listings from the marketplace themselves, the company said. More than 50 authorities around the world are already involved in the early stages of the project, it added. The initiative seems to be mainly directed at the sale of substandard and dangerous electrical goods. Whether this includes items such as power supplies sold with no suppression components is not specifically mentioned. But theoretically, this could enable Ofcom to remove products that do not conform to the UK's EMC requirements. Devices that do not suppress electromagnetic radiation, such as power bricks and lighting dimmer switches, add greatly to the burden of man-made noise suffered by radio amateurs and commercial users of the radio spectrum. You can read the full BBC story at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash news and head for the technology section. The Amateur Radio Legal Defense and Assistance Committee is considering hosting a half-day workshop for attorneys at the ARRL 2022 National Convention in Orlando. This would be for attorneys only and attendees would be eligible to earn continuing legal education credit in their respective states. It would be held on the afternoon of February 10th as part of the Thursday training track sessions for the 2022 convention. ARL DAC is gauging interest to see if it can come up with a core number to make it worthwhile. Interested attorneys should email ARRL Regulatory Information Manager Don Henderson, N1ND, by May 31st, 2021. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters announced recently that negotiations with regulator RSM were successful in accommodating 60-meter operation for New Zealand radio amateurs. Following the end of the two-channel 60-meter trial in New Zealand during 2020, Hams there will now have access to WRC-15 amateur radio secondary allocation of 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz with a maximum allowable power of 15 watts EIRP, which works out to about 9.14 watts forward by applying for a sub-license. An FAQ on the new licensing system for 60 meters has been posted. Scan and email your completed form to NZART headquarters. Once acknowledged by return email, applicants may begin operation. This trial will be for 12 months to allow RSM to assess if any interference issues arise. If none do, then NZART will negotiate with RSM to have the 60 meter band added to the general user radio license, obviating any need for a sub-license in the future. The United States Amateur Radio Society, the ARRL, has a laboratory and its manager, Ed Hare, Whiskey One Romeo Foxtrot India, will be giving a talk on Zoom on Wednesday, May the 19th at 20 hours UTC to the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers Electromagnetic Compatibility Society. Electromagnetic interference is a problem that affects hams and their neighbours alike. Ed, who is also one of the editors of the ARRL Radio Frequency Interference book, has put together a 30-minute slide presentation to give an overview of the politics, personalities and technical issues involved in electromagnetic interference control. His presentation outlines the standard causes and cures for interference. The question and answer session that follows the formal slide presentation will turn this event into a real radio frequency interference workshop. As mentioned, the presentation will be conducted on Zoom, so keep an eye on www.emcsbostonchapter.com and, closer to the meeting date, details of how to join the meeting will be posted. June and July bring frequent 6-meter DX openings via long-distance sporadic e-propagation and persistent quiet geomagnetic conditions. These two months are well known to North American 6-meter DXers as the most productive time of the year for DX up to 8,700 miles. The quiet geomagnetic season during June and July typically has only about half as many geomagnetic storms compared to March and April, says contester and solar observer Frank Donovan, W3LPL. The planetary KP index is usually about two points lower than during March and April, and severe storms are very infrequent. But the quiet geomagnetic season doesn't mean the end of geomagnetic storms. 
Two of the most severe geomagnetic storms during Solar Cycle 24 occurred on June 22nd and 23rd back in 2015. Storms during June and July are not as frequent, strong, or as long-lasting as they are during the geomagnetic storm season of March and April and September and October, but even the most severe storms can occur at any time with little warning. We've had two moderate storms so far in 2021, both during March. We also had eight minor storms, five in March and one each in January, February, and April. June and July 2020 were exceptional for 6 meter DX via sporadic E, and these normally geomagnetically quiet months were exceptionally quiet. The quietest since 1996, Donovan said. I made more than 500 European QSOs during June and July, and more than 100 QSOs with stations in Japan during June, and one very unexpected QSO with UN3GX in mid-June. Donovan noted that no geomagnetic storms occurred in June and July of 2020. The last time this occurred was June and July of 1996. Only four brief geomagnetically active periods occurred in 2020. The rest of 2020 was also exceptionally quiet, with only one moderate storm in late September and eight minor storms, he said. June and July 2019 had two minor storms on June 8th and July 9th and 10th. There were only two moderate storms in 2019 in May and August, and we also had 15 minor storms. Coronal mass ejections caused 2017 to be much more geomagnetically active. June and July 2017 had two moderate storms on July 16th and 17th, and three minor storms on June 11th, 16th, and July 9th, Donovan said. Three strong to severe storms occurred in September and May, with 12 moderate storms and at least 33 minor storms occurred throughout the year. Donovan observed that Earth-directed CMEs are just beginning to cause occasional geomagnetic storms now that Solar Cycle 25 is somewhat more active. During the next few years, CMEs will become the dominant cause of moderate to severe geomagnetic storms, he said. Geomagnetic storms caused by CMEs usually develop more quickly, are more long-lasting, and more severe than the typically brief minor storms caused by coronal hole high-speed streams during the approximately four years near solar minimum. Amateur Radio Digital Communications has provided a grant to help rebuild the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Radio Society Radome. Starting in the early 1980s, the MIT Radio Society took up residence alongside the Radome on the roof of the Green Building, leveraging the highest point on campus accessible to students that provided a manageable, unobstructed laboratory to house equipment and like antenna arrays and an FM repeater. In recent years, the Radio Society adapted and upgraded the Radome for their microwave experiments, most notably enabling its use for Earth-Moon Earth, or moon bounce communications, where signals are bounced off the surface of the moon to reach the earthbound receivers at greater distances than radio communications sent on the ground. Before the pandemic, we had participated in a contest where we used moon bounce to make contact with as many people in as many places as possible to earn points, says Milo Hooper, AI1XR, a senior in mechanical engineering and president of the MIT Radio Society. We had to get up at 2 a.m., make sure the moon was in the right position at the right time, and then we were able to talk to people in Europe and on the West Coast. As a student, it's amazing to have had the opportunity to use a world-class instrument on a college campus. It's unrivaled, he said. To secure the large dish's future and to replace the deteriorating radio, the MIT Radio Society spearheaded a fundraising effort and immediately got to work. Radio Society alumni that helped refurbish their equipment on the roof and they further mobilized the MIT community of alumni and friends by organizing a second campaign. The students also pulled together a successful grant application in record time to Amateur Radio Digital Communications, a nonprofit private foundation supporting amateur radio, resulting in an ARDC's largest ever philanthropic contribution made in memory of the organization's founder, Brian Cantor. This lead gift brought the MIT Radio Society across the finish line to successfully meet their fundraising goal. We were overwhelmed at first by the amount needed to raise and the short time we had before the renovation project needed to begin. 
We had just begun to hope that someone would see the same promise and potential in the dish that we did, said Gregory Allen, KD2HUL, a Ph.D. student in the MIT Department of Aeronautics, who led the ARDC grant submission effort. When we contacted ARDC, they were so supportive and willing to do whatever it took to make this matter happen. We're really grateful to them for this incredible gift. The Radio Society of Great Britain's Examination and Syllabus Review Group has just updated the two full-license mock exam papers. In addition, there are now worked answer PDFs for these papers, so you can see the correct answer for each question and the reasoning behind it. These mock papers are provided by the ESRG as a training aid and aren't the exact questions included in a full license exam. Foundation and intermediate mock exam papers will have worked answers added in due course. You can find all the mock exam papers on the Society's website, rsgb.org forward slash mock hyphen exams. And 2020 was a year like no other for everyone around the world. In the UK, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Radio Amateurs rose to the challenge. The Society has launched a new video that looks back at the many fantastic activities and resources that helped support Radio Amateurs through these difficult times. It also shows how existing Radio Amateurs got on the air to care across the UK and thousands of people of all ages got involved in amateur radio for the first time. You can take a look at the RSGB's YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash the RSGB. Ham Radio Prep, the nation's fastest growing amateur radio education program, recently partnered with Flight Test in the production of a video to promote the use of ham radio for high-powered hobby flights as well as the use of activities such as drones in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. The video, produced on Flight Test's YouTube channel, was titled Laser Gun Battle Between Airplane and Gun Turret and showed the Flight Test crew building a system and a plane that allowed the team to simulate when a radio-controlled plane was hit in the air with a laser beam shot from the ground and vice versa. The video is fast-paced, fun, and shows how technology, especially amateur radio, can be used to promote not only the advancement of technology, but also is helpful in advancing STEM education, a service flight test provides to educators. The flight test video promotes the use of amateur radio for hobby flight operations because ham licenses allow more power and more frequencies than unlicensed use for radio control operations, Chuck Giese, general manager of Ham Radio Prep said, the additional power allows extended range for drone and radio control usage that isn't possible when using unlicensed low power frequencies. Flight Test was created for people who are passionate about flight in an effort to encourage people to build and fly, engage, innovate, and have a great time with the hobby. Flight Test uses the right mix of humor, technology, and information to appeal to those interested in radio control and drone operations. There are more than 750,000 licensed amateur radio operators in the United States and its territories. Ham Radio Prep offers courses designed to teach people online the information they need to take exams that grant them Federal Communications Commission licenses for amateur radio. The courses also teach students how to be legal and safe on the airwaves in accordance with FCC rules and regulations. Ham Radio Prep was established in 2017 to assist people interested in obtaining an FCC-issued amateur radio license by offering courses for the FCC Technician, General, and Extra Class licenses. You can learn more about Flight Test and their mission at their website, which can be found at www flighttest.com. That's www.flitetest.com. Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society has intensified its ongoing efforts to have ham radio equipment declared exempt from import tax and the tax on industrialized products. The exemption being sought by the Liga de Amadores Brasileiros de Radio Amicio, or LEBRA, would be granted to any qualified amateur radio operator and participant in Renner, the National Amateur Radio Emergency Network, or member of SINDEC, the National Civil Defense System. The bill was introduced in 2009, but there has been no action on it since 2018 when it was given to lawmakers in the Finance and Taxation Committee.
Lebra is asking Hams in Brazil to push for a renewal of the effort to get parliamentarians to vote on the measure. Lebra is collecting signatures on a petition on its website to send to the National Congress. The Malaysian Reserve News Service says that more and more women are beginning to use amateur radio. Despite the rapid development of technology based on the use of radio frequencies, such as smartphones, broadband and others, amateur radio still has a place amongst its fans. In the past, this kind of hobby was often associated with men, but now more and more women are beginning to use amateur radio to fill their free time, to the extent of setting up clubs for users of amateur radio, which is considered as a saviour during emergencies. Lecturer at the Institute of Teacher Education in Malaysia, Dr. Norsia Bahari, 9 Whiskey 2, Sierra Golf Papa, said that her interest in amateur radio began in 2010, when she was pursuing her doctorate degree with the need to conduct studies on flora and soil in the Endau Rompin National Park in Pahang. She said that she was made aware that at the time there was no telephone line, especially around the study area, and the only telecommunication medium available was amateur radio. Therefore, she started taking classes and learned the ins and outs of amateur radio, as well as sitting for the exam to get an amateur radio license to facilitate communication whilst conducting her studies in the area. And you can read the full story at themalaysianreserve.com just search for Amateur Radio Lives On. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Let's see, what's going on in the world of tech around us? Well, Microsoft had been touting this Windows 10X for a while the next version of windows it's going to be we're going to rewrite it from scratch we're going to we're going to componentize it and make it more robust and more reliable and and it's going to be for our new dual screen devices the duo and the neo except then the duo came out and it was an android phone what and didn't sell that well because it was fifteen hundred dollars i bought one and took sent it back because it was just not it just it, yeah it wasn't a great phone you know, if you're using it as a phone, it's got to be a good phone, first and foremost. Now it looks like, according to Brad Sams over at Petri, Brad's a smart guy with good sources, that the Neo is probably not going to happen, oh, which is disappointing to me because it was very cool. And nor is the Windows 10X, the special version of the rewritten from scratch, beginning of time version of uh, Windows 10, uh, Win uh, the new next generation of Windows. Microsoft will not be shipping Windows 10X this year, says Brad, this year being 2021, and the OS, as you know it today, will likely never arrive. He writes, for about a decade, Microsoft have been trying to modernize Windows in various ways. One of the problems with Windows, I think some would say this is one of the good things about Windows, is it uh, doesn't abandon the history, the past. It still runs software that came out 20 years ago. <laughs> which is a great labor on Microsoft's part to make that work. Furthermore, impacts stability, security, a lot of things. But they're, you know, hell-bent to keep uh, Windows compatible with everything that ever worked with Windows. You might say, that's not true. I might even say that. But uh, <laughs> so it's kind of like they got the worst of both worlds. It doesn't actually work with every bit of software ever written. And it's as unreliable as if it did. So the old idea was to modernize Windows with Windows 10X. They've actually, this is, they, remember Windows RT that was killed as soon as Satya Nadella became CEO? He said, okay, that's enough of that. And then for briefly, they did Windows 10S, which was a, I don't know what S stood for, stupid, simple, something like that. It was uh, Windows, but you couldn't install any software unless it was in the Microsoft App Store. So it was kind of like uh, iOS. Mm. That hasn't, that didn't really take off. Because there was a switch in it that could turn it into normal Windows, and everybody did that. It's like, well, I, I just want normal Windows, please, thank you. And now Windows 10X. Brad says, the question becomes, is there really a future for anything other than traditional Windows 10? Isn't that funny? It's now traditional Windows 10. Guess not. Okay. Thank you, Microsoft, for, I don't know, for trying? I don't know. Did they even try? I don't know. They probably hired some people and worked on it, yeah. So Apple AirTags came out. I got one on my keys if I could find them. Oh, wait a minute. That's the whole idea. I could find them. It's, uh, you, you know, this is like Tile or, uh, you know, there are a number of these 
the, the tracker, remember? It's been a hard business for Tracker. They almost went out of business. They re, they pivoted, as they say. Tile is number one. Um, but even even they are terrified about Apple's AirTags because here's the deal. This is a Bluetooth tracker. You put it on your keychain or whatever, whatever you lose. And then uh, any iPhone within striking range, about 30 feet, will notice it's there. <clears throat> and if you said, I lost it, it will it will ping you. The iPhone owner won't know it's you. Uh, you won't know the iPhone owner by name or anything, but it'll ping you. It'll say, hey, I saw it down in 4th and Main, and you can run down and get it. So that's, you know, so you don't lose your keys, basically. It has some nice features. If you ha if you lose the keys in, in the house, which is mostly where I leave them in the house, right? And I go, where did I leave them? I can't leave for work until I find them. That's my excuse, by the way. I can't leave for work. And I don't have that excuse anymore because you can point your phone around the house and it'll walk you, like, walk you over there. Say, oh, cold, cold, warm, warm, hot. Wow, that's cool. So that scares Tile to death. So Tile has now made a deal with Amazon to, and this is kind of interesting because Amazon has been working on this. We, we mentioned it. If you have an Amazon Echo device, you are opted into this thing called Sidewalk, which creates what's called a LoRa, a long range network, very low bandwidth, but enough for things like pinging trackers or having, you know, if you have a mailbox down the drive a bit, you can put a little sidewalk device in there and it'll let you know that mail's here or you put it on your dog. And as the dog walks around the neighborhood, you know, if people have got their sidewalk turned on in their Amazon Echo devices, kind of this, the idea would be it would blanket the whole neighborhood. That's actually a pretty strong competitor to Apple's AirTags because AirTags works with a billion iPhones. If Amazon can get these, uh, the sidewalk everywhere and, the, you know, they kind of do have Echoes everywhere. It might be a good thing. Tile, of course, terrified. They, they, the CEO of Tile actually testified against Apple in Congress. <laughs> That's a new thing, right? <laughs> These guys are beating the pants off us in the marketplace. So can you do something about it? Can you fix that? Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe they're just better. I don't know. But the thing that Apple has, of course, is a billion iPhones out there, which is pretty hard to compete with unless you're Amazon. So Sidewalk is going to let Tile devices tap into the network, the Sidewalk network created by uh, millions, not billions, but millions of Echoes. That starts June 14th. So that's kind of interesting. And I would expect that the Tile might extend the Sidewalk too. Amazon also said Sidewalk will strengthen Tile's existing in-home finding experience because you'll be able to say, Echo, find my keys. And the tracker will start beeping. You know what? You could do that before. I don't think that's new. Uh, users with multiple Echo devices connected to Sidewalk. We talked when Sidewalk came out about how to turn that off, but I bet, I bet nobody, I bet very few people even know it. You can. Users with multiple Echo devices connected to Sidewalk will be able to find misplaced items around their home even faster because it can tell which Echo is closest. So it's, you know, they're basically trying to compete with Apple. And who has... Nobody has Apple's market share in smartphones. Well, actually, that's not true. All Android phones equal in the U.S., uh, all the Apple phones. But that's a lot of different manufacturers, and there's a lot of, you know, different ways of doing it and so forth. So, uh, you know, good. Competition's good. It's good for us. It's good for all of us. So I'm happy to see that. Uh, what else? Sennheiser. The uh, I don't know if you care about headphones, but those of us in the radio biz know the name Sennheiser. They have been around for ages. Some of the best headphones out there. In fact, they make a $50,000 pair of headphones. Yeah, yeah, it's got like a marble base, I think. It's, <laughs> but uh, I guess the Sennheiser business, you know, tough. They they started looking for a buyer a couple months ago. The company's consumer products hit record sales in 2019, but they still lost money because, boy, you know, I thought the headphone business was a high profit business. I guess not, because of competition from global rivals. They have been sold. It was still run by the Sennheiser brothers. They must be the kids of the original Sennheiser. It's been around for a while. So for about $241 million, a company called Sonova, a Swiss company known for hearing aids and cochlear implants, Sonova, is buying Sennheiser. They say they'll keep the brand. They'll keep making the headphones. That's not, you know, that's not bad. It's good money in them uh, hearing aids. So they probably have, the, you know, they have the money lying around. And finally, uh, you know, it's what it's it's a slow... But steady pace, computers uh, beat 
the best human players in chess 20 years ago. Then they beat him in Go, a Japanese game, which is even harder, about 10 years ago. Finally, finally, a computer has won the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. Dr. Phil, F-I-L-L. -L, get it? Phil's in the crossword. Puzzle solving a time. You know, I would have thought crossword puzzles would be the first thing computers could do. They know all the words. I guess it's hard because with crosswords, it's the clue that's, you know, obscure and punny. And uh, that's the trick. It's not knowing the word. It's figuring out what the clue means. Dr. Phil was hatched, according to Wired, they use that word, hatched by a guy named Matt Ginsberg. He's a computer scientist and crossword puzzle buff. He actually, he actually builds them. He has been entering Dr. Phil in competition since 2012, making bit-by-bit -bit improvements. And now, for the first time ever, <laughs> Dr. Phil, a computer, has won a, the American Crossword Puzzle Championship. That's kind of, uh, kind of amazing. Although less so when you know that there's 8 million clues and answers in its database. Still, tricky. For instance, certain... Like this, here's one. Here's an example Wired gives. The uh, clue is opium. I'm sorry. The, uh, oh, I gave it away. The clue is measure of neighborhood drug traffic. And the answer was opium density. See, I, I don't know if I'd get that one. You just have to get everything around it, right? So in order to win that, you've got to be fast. Because the humans who solve these crossword puzzles in these competitions, there's a great movie about this, a documentary. They're fast, like like a couple minutes. They go whizz, 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 as fast as they can. Their little hands can write. So I guess the computer, as fast as little mouse could click, won. Sigh. <laughs> First chess, then go. Now crossword puzzles. You know what? It doesn't matter. It's still fun. Ch and when it happened in chess, I, I remember because I'm a pretty serious chess player. Really love the game. And but when it happened, uh, you know, almost 20 years ago, people said, "Oh, nobody's gonna ever want to play chess again." Now they know any machine can beat them. No, that didn't change anything. It's, it, uh, people still play chess against each other and against machines. They still play. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in amateur radio. If there was a buzzword to describe amateur radio in the first three months of 1958, it was satellite. The Russians had launched Sputnik in November of 1957. Thousands of hams tuned in the weak beacon from the satellite on 20 and 40 megacycles. Amateur radio received a lot of publicity as across the nation, many local papers ran articles on the hometown hams and the signals from space. Many amateur operators also were busy building converters for 108 megacycles as the new U.S. Army Signal Engineering Labs in Fort Mammoth, New Jersey had a 50 kilowatt transmitter on that frequency to bounce signals off the moon. The antenna was a 60-foot dish. Those lucky enough to hear it received a special QSL. Also on 108 megacycles was the first U.S. satellite, Explorer, launched in February 1958. Hundreds of reports were received by the ARRL from those who heard it. Amateur radio was growing in 1958. The total number of hams was over 160,000, with predictions that we would go over 200,000 by 1960. ARRL membership was also at its highest level, 60,000. In fact, there were so many hams, the FCC was running out of call signs. The traditional 1x3 calls beginning with W or K were almost completely used up, especially in the 2nd and 6th call areas. To alleviate the problem, the FCC began the 2x3 format. Henceforth, new technician, general, and extra class call signs would begin with WA, while novices would get WV. The large growth in the number of licenses was partially due to the popularity of the novice and technician class. Novices had 50 kilocycles on both 80 and 40 meters, a full 150 kilocycles on 15, and voice privileges on the 145 through 147 megacycle portion of 2 meters. The technician class license, which had started out with only 220 megacycles and above, 
had been given six meters in 1955. With the sunspots at their highest peak in 1958, thousands of novices and technicians were on 15 and 6, working worldwide DX and getting WAC, WAS, and even DXCC awards. This upset some higher class licensees, some of whom demanded a reduction in the number of frequencies available to the novice and technician. No frequencies were taken away. However, the ARRL went on record as being against giving technicians any two-meter privileges. It wasn't until the 1970s that technicians would finally get the full two-meter band. Early in the year, the ARRL filed a strong opposition to a proposal to remove amateurs from the 11-meter band and establish a citizen's radio service there. Granted, the band was lightly used by hams, it wasn't a worldwide allocation, and there was interference from industrial, scientific, and medical devices on 27.12 megacycles. Still, it was our band, and the ARRL made a good argument for keeping it. The FCC was expected to make a decision by the summer. In technical developments, slow scan TV was first described in the August 1958 issue of QST. Transistors were coming out of the purely experimental stage and were starting to show up in practical circuits. There were several all-transistor power supply and modulator projects, and even a transistorized 10-meter walkie-talkie. Mandatory in any 1958 amateur base station was a broadcast band receiver. Why? In a word, Conelrad. Conelrad was the predecessor to the emergency broadcast system. It used key stations which would broadcast emergency messages on 640 or 1240 kilocycles. Every amateur station had a monitor 640 or 1240 kilocycles while on the air. Mobile operators in contact with the base station did not have to monitor Conelrad. Speaking of mobile, do you want to try it? Just remember the simple 1958 FCC rules. Quote, Notices are required to the FCC engineer in charge of the districts wherein the mobile or portable operation is contemplated when such operation shall be in excess of 48 hours without return to the home address. Also, please remember to include the portable location or mobile itinerary, the dates of the beginning and end of each period of operation away from home, and the registry or license number of the vessel, vehicle, or aircraft from which mobile operation is to occur. Unquote. Got that? If you still want to try mobile, then consider the new Collins KWM-1 mobile transceiver. It's a 175-watt input sideband CW rig, which covers the 20, 15, 11, and 10-meter bands. You can get it for only $695. Let's take a look at the other 1958 rigs out there. Halicrafters had several receivers, the SX-99 at $150, the SX100 for $295, and the SX101 at $395. On the transmitter side, there was the HT32, a 144-watt input AM sideband CW unit, which covered the 80, 40, 20, 15, 11, and 10-meter bands for $675. Johnson Viking transmitters ranged in price from $55 for a basic CW kit to $950 for a 600-watt sideband AM CW assembled unit. You can choose a good companion receiver from Hammerland from the HQ100, $170, to the HQ150, $294, to the all-new HQ160, $379. For VHF operators, the Gonset Communicator 3, an AM rig for 6 or 2 meters, was introduced at $270. It was civil defense approved, of course. Clegg had the model 62T10, a 2, 6, and 10 meter transmitter. On the budget side, perfect for the novice, was the new National NC60 general coverage receiver for $60. Heathkit, of course, had some excellent bargains from the DX20 CW rig for $35 to the DX40, a 75-watt AM CW rig for 80 through 10 meters, including 11 meters, at $65 to a general coverage receiver for only $30. 
All of the above were kits, of course. How many Radio Shack stores were there in 1958? Two, Boston, Massachusetts and New Haven, Connecticut. Radio Shack had a six transistor portable radio for only $29.95, which was perfect for monitoring Conrad. But the big news in 1958 came from Collins. Late in the year, they introduced the S line of equipment. Collins took out glorious, exquisite, multi-page, full-color ads in QST to show off the 32S1 transmitter, the 75S1 receiver, and the 30S1 linear amplifier. A new standard had been set in amateur radio, and sideband was here to stay. On September 11th, 1958, the FCC came to a decision. Our 11-meter band would be removed from us and turned over to the new Class C and Class D Citizens Band. A new concept was developing, that access to the airwaves should be made available to individuals for non-technical, non-hobby personal communications. It was the dawn of a new era. In our next installment, we'll look at amateur radio in the early 1960s. I hope you will join me. Time now for the AMSAT report. Back on May 1st, it was reported by Paolo PV8DX that JY1SAT or JO97 had gone silent. After a few days of silence, it came back to life and was reported operational on May 4th. The telemetry beacon remains inactive, however. The satellite has an inverting linear transponder with an uplink from 435.100 MHz to 435.120 MHz, lower sideband, and a downlink from 145.855 to 145.875 MHz, upper sideband. JO97, a project of the Crown Prince Foundation of Jordan, was launched in December 2018. The satellite uses a FunCube linear transponder, and the telemetry beacon, when working, is able to also transmit stored SSDV digital images. Another satellite is welcome to the Oscar family. DIY Satellite Group's DIY-1 Pocket Cube was launched on March 21st. It is operational and carries a deorbiting device experiment along with a CW, RTTY, and FSK beacon. It is now known as DIY Oscar 111 or DO 111. And to think A07 is still operational to see its Oscar descendants grow. The MSAT report is provided each week by Bruce Page, KK5DO. The Wiza Woodsat project, being sponsored by plywood supplier Wiza, is an unconventional public relations initiative poised to place a wooden satellite into orbit by the end of the year. Here is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, with more details on this fascinating project. The idea is to test the suitability of treated wood as a low-cost and widely available material for space applications. Several amateur radio experiments will be on board, as well as photo downlinking, including selfies. Yes, we're not making this up. The satellite will have a selfie stick. The satellite will be a 10 centimeter cube weighing one kilogram covered on all sides by coated birch plywood. Nine small solar cells will supply the power to the satellite, which will orbit at an altitude of 500 to 550 kilometers. As the sponsor explains, Wiser Woodsat will go where no wood has gone before with a mission to gather information on the behavior and durability of plywood over an extended period in the harsh temperatures, vacuum, and radiation of space in order to assess the use of wood materials in space structures. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The wooden satellite is based on a basic versatile CubeSat format, KitSat, which is designed with educational use in mind. It retails for just $1,500. Based in Finland, the Woodsat project began with students across the country contributing parts to a CubeSat launched by a balloon. Once in orbit, Woodsat will be able to extend a selfie stick to capture photographs of the wooden box as it hurtles through space at 40,000 kilometers per hour. This will allow the mission leaders to monitor the impact of the environment on the plywood. The satellite would downlink its telemetry and images from the two cameras using amateur radio frequencies. 
The wooden satellite with a selfie stick will surely bring laughter and goodwill, added the mission manager, Jari Minkinen, of the Arctic and Aeronautics. Essentially, this is a serious science and technology endeavor. In addition to testing plywood, the satellite will demonstrate accessible radio amateur satellites, communications, host several secondary technology experiments, and validate the Kitsat platform in orbit and popularize space technology. An April 23rd Engineering and Technology article has more information. Amber Whiskey Hotel 6 Gulf Gulf India reports that the Neutron 1 CubeSat team, part of AMSAT South Africa, is looking for amateurs around the world to help troubleshoot its satellite. The team believes that the satellite goes into safe mode intermittently, making communications difficult. The satellite has had an operational beacon since deployment, but its operation is irregular. The beacon downlink should be 60 seconds apart. Beacons have been captured by various amateurs around the world and via the SATNOGS ground station satellite network. Commands have been transmitted to change the beacon rate and the satellite has responded correctly, but the success rate is only approximately 1%. With broader community involvement, the team believes it should be able to increase the probability of successful communications with the satellite. The Neutron One team are asking for the community's involvement to attempt to send a larger set of commands that would allow them to troubleshoot the satellite and attempt to make it fully operational. The goal is to get Neutron One to be more responsive to commands sent from the ground and to activate the science payload and download its data. You can find out more about how to send commands to the satellite at www.amsatsa.org.za. And if you plan to have a go at transmitting commands or have received the satellite beacon, or if you have any questions, then please contact the team via email n1-info at hsfl.hawaii.edu. Golf T, the first satellite in AMSAT's Greater Orbit Larger Footprint, or GOLF program, has been put on the manifest for NASA's educational launch of Nanosatellites Mission 46. AMSAT says the goal of the GOLF program is to work by steps through a series of increasingly capable spacecraft in learning to develop systems and skills needed to achieve successful high-orbit missions. Among these are active attitude control and the ability to command attitude changes, deployable steerable solar panels, radiation tolerance for commercial off-the-shelf components in higher orbits, and propulsion. The eventual goal of the GOLF program is a satellite in highly elliptical orbit similar to AO-10, AO-13, and AO-40, but at an affordable cost combined with significantly enhanced capabilities, allowing the use of much less complex ground stations, AMSAT said. Golf T will be a fully functional low-Earth orbit VHF-UHF amateur satellite carrying a linear transponder similar to the one flown on AO-109. The T in Golf T stands for Technology Exploration Environment. It reflects Golf T's mission of testing two primary systems needed for higher orbits. First, an attitude determination and control system will be tested to allow active pointing of the satellite's antennas, which will have significant gain. The other primary goal of Golf T is to gain initial orbit and space radiation exposure for radiation event-induced fault-tolerant systems designed using off-the-shelf components. Golf T will carry an integrated housekeeping unit and command transceiver designed using the Hercules line of ARM architecture-based microcontrollers. Golf T will also evaluate a low-cost deployable fixed-attitude solar panel array design as part of AMSAT Engineering's exploration of fixed panel arrays that allow for outfitting a variable number of wings in order to best match the power requirements of various CubeSat missions. Additionally, Golf T will carry a modified commercial software-defined radio, the Edis E310 as an experimental package to test a high-speed 10 gigahertz data downlink. Bob Roninga, WB4APR, says a PSET-2 VHF transceiver awoke from an eight-month slumber on April 26th. We have no idea why its telemetry looks fine, Bruninga said. Voltage is between 6.2 and 7 volts, and exterior temperatures are between negative 18 and negative 22 centigrade. 
PSAT 2 will not be in automatic packet reporting system mode, but in a brand new experimental mode for dual tone multi-frequency or DTMF uplink 145.980 MHz and voice downlink. You preload your grid and call sign into the 16 digit DTMF memory in your radio. And when the satellite hears this, it will assign a QSO number and QSL the grid by voice and generate an APRS packet, Bruningus explained. There's even a way to send back a DTMF QSL so you can make it a two-way DTMF contact. Successful DTMF grids and messages will appear on a special URL on the PSAT2 page. To QSL, key in that station's two-digit QSL number and then dump your preloaded QSL DTMF message. Bruninga adds, read the docs and be sure you know what you're doing. A PSAT2 user's operation manual is available on the PSAT2 webpage. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspot activity returned last Friday, May 7th, and has held steady ever since. Average daily sunspot numbers rose from 11.9 to 21.1, and average daily solar flux was up 2.1 points to 74.3 for the reporting week ending on May 12th. Geomagnetic activity was quiet until Wednesday, May 12th, when the planetary A index went to 41 as a result of a coronal mass ejection that blasted out of the sun on May 9th. It was not expected to be very strong, but when it struck on May 12th, it sparked a G3-class geomagnetic storm, the strongest so far in the current solar cycle. As a result, the planetary A index rose to 41, far above an average of 3.8 on the previous six days. The average daily planetary A index for the May 6th to the 12th reporting week was 9.1, and average middle latitude A indice went to 7.4. The predicted solar flux over the next few weeks is 75 on May 14th to the 19th, 70 on May 20th and 21st, 72, 80, and 79 respectively on May 22nd to the 24th, 78, 77, and 73 on May 25th to the 27th, and 72 on May 28th to the 30th. The predicted solar flux of 84 on June 15th in the middle 45-day forecast seems to be an outlier. It's odd that the predicted solar flux would shift from 78 to 84 to 77, but we saw a similar prediction recently for that same value a week into the future. Any trace of it here seems to have disappeared down the memory hole. So as a result, the predicted planetary A and dice is 5 on May 14th to the 16th, 15, 12, 8, 5, and 8 on May 17th to the 21st, and 5 on May 22nd to June 5th. Foundations of Amateur Radio As you might recall, I took delivery of a device called a Pluto SDR some time ago. If you're not familiar, it's a single board computer that has the ability to transmit and receive between 70 MHz and 6 GHz. The system is intended as a learning platform. It's open source, you get access to the firmware, compilers and a whole load of other interesting tools. I used it to play with Aviation Receive using a tool called Dump1090, which I updated to use OpenStreetMap. If you're interested, it's on my VK6 FLAB GitHub page. Over the past few months, I've been steadily acquiring little bits and pieces, which today added up to a new project. Can I use my Pluto SDR to transmit Whisper? This all started because of an experiment and a conversation. The experiment was... Using my FT-857D on 70cm, can I transmit a weak signal mode like Whisper and have my friend on the other side of the city decode the transmission? The answer to that was a qualified yes. I say qualified since we weren't able to transmit a Whisper message, but using FT-8 we were happily getting decodes across the city. We're not yet sure what the cause of this difference is, other than the possibility that the combined frequency instability at both ends was large enough to cause an issue for a whisper message, which lasts about two minutes. On the other hand, I learned that my radio can in fact go down to two watts on 70 centimeters. I've owned that radio for over a decade, never knew. Now that I have a bandpass filter, some SMA leads, and the ability to talk to my Pluto across the Wi-Fi network, I can resurrect my Pluto adventures and start experimenting. 
I mentioned that this was the result of an experiment and a conversation. The conversation was about how to create a whisper signal in the first place. At the moment, if you run WSJTX, the software will generate audio that gets transmitted via a radio. All fine, except if you don't have a screen or a mouse. Interestingly, a whisper transmission doesn't contain any time information. It's an encoded signal, containing your call sign, a maidenhead locator, that's a 4 or 6 character code representing a grid square on Earth, and a power level. That message doesn't change every time your transmitter starts the cycle. So if you were to create, say, an audio file with that information in it, you could just play the audio to the nearest transmitter, like a handheld radio, or in my case, a Pluto. And as long as you started it at the right time, the decoding station wouldn't know the difference. As an aside, if you're playing along with your own Pluto, and far be it for me to tell you to go and get one, you can set the Pluto up using either USB in which case it's tethered to your computer, or you can get yourself a USB to Ethernet adapter and connect to it via your network. If you have a spare Wi-Fi client lying around, you can get that to connect to your Wi-Fi network, connect the Pluto via Ethernet to the Wi-Fi client, and your gadget is connected wirelessly to your network. I can tell you that this works. I'm typing commands on the Pluto as we speak. As is the case in any experiment in amateur radio, you start with one thing and work your way through. At the moment, I want to make this as simple as possible. By that, I mean as few moving parts as I can get away with. I could right now fire up some or other SDR tool, like say GNU Radio, and get it to do the work and make the transmission. But what I'd really like to do is actually have the Pluto do all the work. So I'm starting small. Step one is to create an audio file that I can transmit using the Pluto. It turns out that step one isn't quite as simple as I'd hoped. I located a tool that actually purports to generate an audio file, but the file that it builds cannot be decoded, so there is still some work to be done. On the face of it, the level of progress is low, but then this whole thing has been going for months. The experiment on 70 centimeters lasted half an hour. The discussion took all of a cup of coffee. So far, I've spent more time on this project making the Wi-Fi client talk to my network than all the rest put together, and that includes finding and ordering the Pluto in the first place. You might well wonder why I'm even bothering to talk about this as yet unfinished project. The reason is simple. Every day is a new one. Experiments are what make this hobby what it is, and every little thing you learn adds to the next thing you do. Some days you make lots of progress. Other days you learn another way not to make a light bulb. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Although China successfully launched the first module for that station's space station, the mission launcher re-entered Earth's atmosphere along an uncontrolled path. The uncontrolled low orbit of a Chinese Long March rocket ended in a flare of light over the Arabian Peninsula before the rocket plunged into the Indian Ocean near the Maldives. The dramatic re-entry into Earth's atmosphere came late on Saturday, May 8th, quieting nervous speculation that the space debris from the empty core of the Long March 5B would land in a populated region. The Chinese space agency said much of the rocket was consumed during re-entry. At 22 tons, it was considered one of the largest objects to re-enter the atmosphere with an uncontrolled trajectory. Its path had been followed by the U.S. Space Command's Space Track Project and European Space Surveillance and Tracking. There had been concern that the rocket's fate might have been similar to that of the first Long March 5B. During a similar uncontrolled re-entry in May last year, debris from the rocket fell in an area of the Ivory Coast in Africa, where it damaged several buildings. Meanwhile, it moves through its solar cycle. The activity of the sun causes changes in the ionosphere of the planet Venus. CNN is reporting that the Parker Solar Probe in a flyby of the planet last summer, picked up a naturally occurring low-power radio signal and determined that the Venusian ionosphere is thinner during solar minimum than during solar maximum. Last summer's flyby happened six months after the solar minimum. The probe found changes that had occurred in Venus' upper atmosphere since data collection nearby three decades ago by the Pioneer Venus Orbiter in 1992 during a high activity period. Although the Parker probe's primary mission is to study the Sun, it does interact with Venus because it uses gravity assist from the planet 
to bend the orbit of the probe and bring it closer to the sun. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Replacing rotors on towers is not a fun job. They usually sat for a long time before we decided to replace them, so the bolts and screws will surely be nicely rusted. I know, I have one on my tower right now too. I've done this job a few times in the past, so let's look at the three primary types of installations. From my experience, rotors are mostly installed inside the tower near the bottom or inside the tower near the top. They can also be on the top of the tower outside of the tower frame. By far the worst one to work with is the last, the rotor on the very top and outside of the tower. If you do not have the proper gear, tools, strength and experience, I recommend you hire someone with a cherry picker to do this job for you. If you have the expertise to safely perform this task the way I do them, after deciding the tower is strong enough to survive the job, I mount clamps to the side of the tower, remove the mast from the rotor and slide it into my temporary clamps, swap out the rotor and reinstall the antenna mast into the new rotor. This has to be done on a windless day. As an added precaution on smaller TV antenna grade towers, I always add temporary guy ropes to secure the tower from the tremendous shaking and stresses one of these rotor swap out jobs can put on any tower. If the tower is a fold over type or a roof mount type, I usually refuse to do the job unless the tower is guyed at every 10 to 15 feet with steel cable. I have never done work on a fold over tower above the hinge and neither should you. On towers where the rotor is inside the tower, there is usually some plate or place to install a U-bolt clamp above the rotor. Then I loosen the clamps that hold the mast inside the top of the rotor, slide up the mast, and now tighten the bolts on the U-bolt above the rotor to keep the mast from sliding back down into the rotor. A suitable temporary clamp, which can hold some weight, is a hefty vice grip pliers. On towers without a clamping plate of some type above the rotor, I have used the 2x4 stuffed into the tower in its place. Essentially, the rotor removal job is the same process regardless of the location of the rotor inside the tower, either at the bottom or at the top. If the rotor is inside the tower near the top, bending the mast pipe is the big risk. So always insert a wooden doll rod inside the mast pipe to prevent bending. The doll rod should be close to the same size as the inside of the mast pipe or it won't prevent bending. These are generally available at your local hardware store. Otherwise, a fat broom handle may fit inside the mast pipe just fine too. Some people insert a second steel pipe that is a tight fit inside the section of mast pipe that passes through the top of the tower and pin it to keep it in place. When replacing the rotor, another trip to the hardware store should be done first to replace all those cheaply plated screws, nuts and bolts with stainless steel parts. This may be time consuming, but you'll be thankful you took the time years down the road when the new rotor is ready to retire. Otherwise, you'll become an expert with a hacksaw on the tower, which ain't fun. If you decide to hire this job out, be sure to check the yellow pages for companies that trim trees. Their work is largely seasonal, so you may be able to negotiate a lower price for the work if you are willing to wait maybe even months for the truck and be ready to go when they call you and tell you that today is your lucky day. From my experience, tree service people are generally cheaper than TV and tennis service places too. One topic I already mentioned which is worth repeating, never work on a standing fold over tower above the hinge. Never climb a base fold over or roof mounted tower that is not guide every 10 to 15 feet. Best bet is to never climb any fold over tower. You should add temporary guys to any light duty TV antenna tower. And lastly, do what I do. When someone asks you to climb their tower for them, always tell them you reserve the right to stop the job at any time for any reason if you feel your safety is in question and you will not argue or debate about restarting a job which was stopped for safety concerns. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, which are a members-only benefit. 
To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, visit the AWRL webinar webpage. W1AW Antenna Farm, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia and J1Q, will take place on Tuesday, May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Experience a bird's eye view and description of the antennas used by W1AW for the station's scheduled transmissions and visiting operator activity. All the antennas used at W1AW are single band Yagi's. Viewers will also see the 5 GHz sector antennas that are part of W1AW's Arden system. Ask the Lab How ARRL's Technical Information Service Can Help You. Hosted by ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare. W1RFI will take place on Tuesday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Learn all about the ARRL Technical Information Service and the expert ARRL laboratory staff who answer thousands of questions each year from members. Get tips about projects, suggestions to address various station installations, and help for some of your most pressing ham radio questions. You'll discover how to search ARRL's extensive periodicals archive, find helpful articles, read test reports, access technical forms, and find answers to technical questions. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. This listing of the ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. The annual CW Boot Camp put on by the Essex CW Club will be held in Witham on Saturday, October the 16th, 2021. The doors open at 8.30am for registration. The meetings begin at 9am, so please be sure to arrive in plenty of time to register. The day finishes at approximately 4.30pm. Securing your place at the boot camp will require a non-refundable payment of £10. Places are filling up quickly, so if you'd like to attend, please email Andy G0 India Bravo November. His address is golf0 India Bravo November 1 at yahoo.com. Your main decision is the group you want to work with. There will be four tables, up to 10 words per minute, 10 to 20 words per minute, there are two tables in this category, and 20 plus words per minute. Within each group, the aim is to show you how to progress to the top of that group. Note that at times, all groups are combined for a number of talks and group morse activities. So if you feel your group is going too fast or too slow, or you just fancy a change, you're free and indeed encouraged to move table at any time during the day. This is quite an intensive day. If you become tired or you don't want to do a particular activity, you can opt out, have a coffee, operate the live station, supervised or not supervised, as you wish. The day will also feature the fun and very popular High Speed Morse Contest. There will also be someone to talk to about setting up your Morse station and operating techniques. So what do you need to take? Well, you need all of the following. You need a Morse key with a 3.5mm jack or a suitable adapter, headphones with the same jack requirements, a writing pad and a pencil or pen, and a name badge if you have one. Plastic cups will be available, but if you prefer to hold on to something more solid, then please bring your own mug. The team will provide coffee, tea, snacks, and a lunch of hot sausage rolls. Bear in mind, they only take a 30-minute lunch break, so no sneaking down to the pub. The team promises a very enjoyable and rewarding day. You'll be able to put faces to names and call signs and meet new fellow enthusiasts. But most importantly, you'll have a clear picture of your Morse strengths and weaknesses and know how to fix and exploit those to improve your operating speed and technique. You'll also be able to obtain information and answers about things that puzzle you. Should I use a paddle key? What are all those different types for anyway? And how do I set up my straight key? What's the correct procedure for contesting? And what is the best Morse software? And so on. The venue address is the 3rd Witham Scout and Guide HQ at the rear of Spring Lodge Community Centre in Witham, Essex. Well, the club has already tweeted that due to the boot camp's popularity, spaces are limited. So if you'd like to attend, that email address again. Golf Zero India Bravo November 1 at yahoo.com. 
Beauvais Island is like the Mount Everest of DXCC entities. 3YOJ D-Expedition co-leader Paul Ewing, N6PSE, said, It is among the most challenging entities to activate due to significant transportation costs and personal sacrifices required by the team to make the 42-day round trip. Fortunately, Bouvet is not our first mountain. With more on this exciting de-expedition, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The de-expedition's website describes Bouvet as a cold and inhospitable place. At 54 degrees south, Bouvet, a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic and a dependency of Norway, is the most remote place on Earth. Ewing announced recently that Mike Cronover, AB5EB, a veteran emergency room physician, has joined the 3Y0JD expedition team to pair with team member and ER doctor Bill Straw, KO0SS. The D expedition is set for January and February of 2023, but the planning stages to activate the second most wanted DXCC entity are well underway with the team researching polar quality tents and equipment and discussing antenna specifications with various manufacturers. The 3Y0J team has set a goal of making at least 100,000 contacts from Bouvet and Ewing promised 3Y0J will be a de-expedition with a focus on good, fast, and accurate operating. QSO rates will be very high. Operation will focus on CW, SSB, and digital for 160 through 10 meters. Ewing said that in the later stages of the de-expedition, operators will use what he called proven techniques to work the weakest of callers. We will also use techniques to work the youth in our audience, he said. Stay tuned. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. We will make careful choices to help us meet the demand for Bouvet contacts. Our goal is to match our VP8STI stroke VP8SGI achievement with 135,000 contacts made. No real-time log search will be available, but 3YOJ will upload to Club Log and to M0OXO log search each day, Ewing said. The D-Expedition has an estimated budget of $764,000, with each team member contributing a minimum of $20,000 each. In April, AWRL awarded a Colvin grant of $5,000 to the Intrepid DX Group to help in funding the 3YOJ de-expedition. Ewing and AWRL member Ken Opscar, LA7GIA, will share de-expedition leadership duties. Follow the de-expedition plans from the de-expedition website and Facebook page. The Irish Radio Transmitter Society, AGM, was held on April the 24th. Each year, trophies are presented to amateurs who achieve a very high standard in home construction. This year, the Folan Shield was presented to Tom Nevin, Echo India 4 Hotel Charlie Bravo, and the Kevin Freeney Trophy was presented to Darwin Penamora, Echo India 4 Kilo X-Ray. There was only one motion before the 2021 AGM, and this came from the Galway Radio Experimenters Club, who asked that IRTS, in representing Ireland, supported the inclusion of a new license level in Ireland as part of a three-year plan. Following a well-researched and well-presented case by the Galway representatives, the motion was nevertheless defeated by the narrowest of margins. ERA only has one class of license, permitting up to one kilowatt output. The Harrick equivalent exam comprises 60 questions, substantially fewer than the proposed Radio Society of Great Britain direct to full exam in the UK. Although the company that runs the RSGB online exams, Test Reach Limited, is based in Dublin, no online exams are available in ERA. All exams are in person and are held infrequently at a limited number of testing centres. Next year's annual general meeting will be hosted by the South Eastern Radio Group, date and venue to be announced, and you can read more at www.irts.ie. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. 
If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position. An amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone. Headset mics are not used. And be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, the Arizona Historical Society has an online history lesson scheduled. Its topic is a lawmaker who is also one of the most high-profile American hams. The late United States Senator Barry Goldwater was also known by his call sign K7UGA. History has recorded his many contributions as a lawmaker to the evolution of amateur radio in the U.S. The Arizona Historical Society is presenting a virtual event on Wednesday, May 19th that explores the life of the state's most notable amateur radio operator who during the war in Vietnam was instrumental in organizing volunteers to connect families via ham radio with their relatives serving overseas during the conflict. The society, based in Tucson, houses much of the senator's longtime shack in its collection. The presentation by Arizona State University history professor Eric Nystrom will be held from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific Time. That's 0100 UTC. A donation to the museum is requested for anyone attending the discussion, which will be held on Zoom. Contact the Arizona Historical Society for a link to the meeting. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.